answer to Sarah's email from 213 this afternoon is the best link. Yeah, so, the original one I had didn't work, but the one Sarah sent out. Yeah, and, and our problem has worked. been that um, Christina has COVID, and so she may have done things, but then when Sarah took over, we may have had two different meeting uh, links. Um, and Christina is still testing positive, so probably won't be back until mid to late this week. Okay. Well, we're going to call the water supply meeting, water supply planning committee meeting for September the 5th, 2023. And the time is 305 to order. Uh, a quick roll call. Director Riley. Uh, he is on the attendees side, so we bring him over. Presto. Director Paul? Here. <laughs> Here. <laughs> Director Riley? Here. Chair Edwards? Here. All members are present. Uh, thank you. Okay, uh, comments from the public. The public will make comment on any item within the district jurisdiction. Please limit your comments to three minutes. Chair Edwards, I see Susan Schiavone. He'll give me just a moment. All right. I'll need to get the timer up. Susan, once you see the clock starting, you may share your comments. Hi, I'll be quick. Um, I hope it's an appropriate question, but um, at the last board meeting I attended, there was some discussion about Calam not using the amount of water they could take from the Carmel River right now and instead taking stored water. And I'm just wondering if there's been some movement on resolving that issue. That was my question. Thank you. Chair Edwards, I see no other raised hands. Okay. Uh, Jim, you want to attempt to answer that one or you want to wait to have one at a regular meeting? No, I can answer quickly. It, it appears to be the case. Um, and there's nothing that we can do to rectify it at this point because, uh, you know, we're in the last month of the water year. And so, you know, current demands are going to be met the way the system is plumbed and it very likely will leave water in the river uh, in that water right and we'll have oh. the actual end of year data you know in draft form about the second week of october okay thank you just a question go ahead uh, through through the chair um does staff have have any more information um that than we had at the last board meeting about the reasons for Calam, yeah, uh, not yet. Nope, no, okay. no new info. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thanks. I, I guess we'll be talking a little bit about more of that one at the board meeting. I heard about that one. I listened to it. Time to send some kind of letter out. We we'll talk about it. Thank you. Okay, Jim. What's the first action item? The first item is. Uh, consider approval or adoption rather of the minutes from the July meeting. I don't have any corrections. I move approval, unless you got the public, I guess. We have a, a first, um, we're gonna get a second before we go out to the public. Uh, I'll second that. Okay, in a second. Okay, Sarah, let's take it out to the public 
and see anybody want to comment on the minutes. Chair Edwards, I see no raised hands. Okay, no raised hands. Okay, we have a first by Director Rowley, a second by Director Paul. Uh, all in favor, say aye. Oh, aye. Zoom. Well, it's roll call. Roll call vote because it's Zoom. Okay. Director Paul? Yes. Director Riley? Aye. Chair Edwards? Yes. The motions are adopted 3 0. Thank you. Uh, discussion items. Jane, All right. What's the first one. Yeah, this first one's kind of fun. Um, we'll let uh, John Lear uh, take you for a tour of a new portal that we're developing uh, accessible through our website. Uh, John, take it away. Okay. If I did that right, you should be seeing my screen. Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, good afternoon, directors. Um, this is a report on a couple different projects that um, you guys have been funding over the last three uh, fiscal years. Um, we've come in the uh, fiscal year 1920 budget and 2021 and 2122 budget. Um, and uh, we went through in 1920 and we replaced a number of the uh, actual um, equipment that's out in the field for about half the gauges. Uh, we then came through the next year and replaced the rest of the equipment. The goal of replacing those equipment was to replace um, the logging equipment with uh, equipment that could be telemetered and to have the entire stream network and rainfall network uh, telemetered back to our offices so we can use it, share it with the public, share it with education, make uh, operational decisions with it. And this last year, as Dave said, we've pulled it all into a web portal. Uh, so what I wanna do is, if you recognize this, this is our website. Um, I'm going to show you what what the, what we have that's old and then what the new will be replacing. Um, what we have now is the Carmel River Basin. You can click on it and you can click on Carmel River Flows and it will bring up um, stations that are on the main stem. And what this data gives you is you can click on Carmel River Below Los Padres and it will pull up a... Uh, eight day running plot of what the what the flow has been at that gauge. You also have that for Sleepy Hollow Weir and moving down to Highway One Bridge. There's a tributary Garza's Creek that's included in this because it uh, has some operational decisions on how that well is made with uh, some fish implications. Um, you also have the ability to click on a daily discharge summary and it brings up a flat page like this where it has the daily discharge for each of the days. And this is what's called the USGS uh, format. So this has um, a very long history of stream flow data being uh, reported in this way. So you basically have some of this information information, um, but it's it's organized in a way that's kind of buried a little deep on the website. And then the archival is just kind of a running stream on the right hand side of the of the website, which you can go into, but it doesn't. Um, it just has no graphs. It just has the flat data sets. Um, this often isn't usable for people like students that are using uh, want data requests. The, the data requests often span different um, data periods. Um, we have currently on our website rainfall data. It's organized much the same way where you can go in and see the rainfall chart. You recognize this one from um, uh, Dave's presentations. Um, so this is being generated. These data are updated um, uh, hourly to our website but what we want what we're moving to is what we call we were going to link to this which is called um, our data portal or it's an api uh, so this is a much better um, uh, way to display this so uh, we've built a one link interface that will bring you to 
an interacting map where you can you can scroll around on the map you can see all of the instantaneous flows these are updated uh, hourly as well so we can and as well as it has the precipitation data and it has the lagoon stage and it has reservoir stage so we can go into what i showed you before which was sleepy hollow weir um, which is just downstream of below those padres and you can interact with it by just clicking on it on the map. You actually have, you can go in here and you can change August. You can change it back to a different date. It will go retrieve the data. You can see here on the map, these, these uh, squares are where um, your hydrologists are going out and actually measuring the data. So you can glance at this and see uh, when someone's actually gone out and, and grabbed the data. And then we know that the data is correct um, to uh, field measurements. Uh, when, you when you're when you interacting with um, the data here, you can go over to the menu bar and you're allowed to print a chart, download a PDF, download a JPEG. You can export the data on the chart to a running comma separated value um, or a JSON data set, which uh, different programs and programmers like them in different sets. Um, so we can go back to the map. You can zoom in. It's a lot like Google Maps where you can put satellite imagery on this. Um, you can go through one of the problems that we had in the past is we would display um, we would display rainfall data and it would be a daily total. Um, often rainstorms are not nice enough to just rain from one midnight to another midnight. So we would have people waking up in the valley calling in and saying, your your rainfall total uh, doesn't match what I got on my gauge. And we would have to explain to them that, uh, well, uh, we're actually measuring from midnight to midnight and the rest of the storm will show up tomorrow morning. So check back tomorrow morning. But we have the ability here to have a one hour rainfall total, three hour, six hour. Obviously we're not showing anything because it hasn't rained. But when we go to year to date, you'll see at Santa Margarita at our injection wells, we've got 22.5 inches to date. And then at Los Padres, we've got the 35.24 uh, that we report to you. Um, you can also, for well, we use these um, to help the fisheries uh, guide uh, where to rescue. We can see where the river's drying back. Um, we can not only have flow, but we can go in here and we can see how deep the river is. So we can see stages of the river. So we know if we're drying back into pools or not. And we can also show the temperature of the river. Um, so they know, so the fisheries biologists know where it's getting warm and how to prioritize with temperature and depth. Uh, of the river in real time up to our conditions. At the top of this, we have what we've created is a list view. So you can go in one spot and you can see flow stage and temperature at every one of our reporting gauges uh, and, and then our uh, reservoir levels and our rainfall as well for all of our stations. We will be bringing on two more stations as a component of this um, this year we have upgraded some systems and our system uh, and our database system to accept uh, satellite communication. So we will have an above those Padres gauge come onto this uh, data porthole, which will be able to manage the reservoir much better by understanding daily uh, inflows to the reservoir, as well as we'll be able to bring in San Clemente Creek and Pine Creek, which don't have cell reception currently. Um, we will be able to use the um, satellite com. Um, the last item on this part of the interface is you can go to what's a dashboard and it will bring up just all of the all of the graphs for different for, for you can see um, what everything is doing at once and this is you, know, you can zoom into different different zones and you can reset your zoom uh, as well. Um, you can go back to so this is the first part which is a map list dashboard um uh, click click it and then go in and um you can zoom in we can say let's go back to uh, the beginning of the the beginning of the water year and it uh when you 
you can also hit table and it will bring up your 15 minute tabular data that you're being dis that's being displayed as well so you can zoom in and see exactly what it is by interacting with the graph um and the last component this has a it has a we'll send you guys the link to this it has a how to use where where it will we'll go through and explain to you what all the different components are and how to use it so this is available to the public when we put this on um it talks about the different sensors we use to try to educate people. But then this is the last functionality is we have a download section where you can pick the the um, data format you like and you can pick, uh, I'd like Potrero Creek and I would like this date range. I understand the data is provisional and I can say get data. And here it says click the download file. And right here, you can see now uh, we downloaded our file, which um, is a way to send people to do data requests. Um, as I showed you before, the data that we have on our website, we do have historic data, but it's in somewhat of an unusable format. So it was it was actually taking quite a bit of employee hours to fulfill data requests from uh, education or other um, regulatory agencies. But now we can just point them to this. So this was something that you guys had approved in the 2022-2023 budget, and we've just got it developed now, and our timing was that so we could um, get this into the website upgrade. And so if there's any questions about this. Yeah, John, um, go back to, yeah, there we go, to reservoirs, and let's take a look at, is the data populated for the lagoon at this point? Yes, you have to, you have to toggle this. Yep, so let's, let's see how, so we have many members of the public who access our data and two of the biggest, uh, well, three of the biggest uh, locations are the lagoon levels. So when the lagoon is um, kind of reaching flood stage before it's been breached, there are many, many people who plug into it to kind of see where the lagoon is at. Um, it's closed now, I think. The, yep, the yeah, sand right. dunes all the way across. Correct. So you see a constant level. Yeah, you can see in the data here, you can see the lagoon coming up, being closed, then opening, and then it has tidal cycles to it, and then it's closed again here. So um, we can tell just by looking at this what our system is doing. And then another place people love to go, of course, is the rainfall totals, just to get a sense of what happened. And then... Um, you know, like the folks in, in Paso Hondo, there's another, isn't there another gauge, a, a USGS gauge, or are we, no, we're combined on all this, but. Well, um, no. well what we're going to do, so right now we're just working on, this was our beta, and we were working on just getting our data into it, yeah. but there is a Monterey County um, uh, rainfall data network that we will, j just like, um, you know, so here is near Carmel, and so it's it says you know what what you want to show on ours um you should go look at the usgs but if we wanted to have a month of data we could go into here and it's going to go and pull the most recent usgs data into this but it says this is a usgs gauge this is not our data and so we'll do that with the rainfall networks as well yeah and then uh stream flow you know we even like what when the county was thinking of announcing closure of 68, we go to the Spreckles gauge and we look to see what's going on with the Salinas River. Um, you know, folks will look at the Don Juan gauge to get a read of what's happening to the river kind of upstream. Um, you know, so it's like during the winter when people are worried about flood stages, you see a lot more hits on these things, of course, than you would in the summer. Um, but it's uh, it's a much more powerful tool and uh, usable tool than what we've had in the past. So I and I think it's pretty cool. So I just like the the, the coolness factor of it, frankly. But um, we used another system's data during that whole discussion of water rights with uh, Brugnara up in uh, near Gilroy and. Um, people will use our data for their purposes as well. So it's, it's pretty cool.
Okay. Uh, any other, any um, committee questions? I just another comment. Um, I was glad that you started out at the uh, district's website to get us there. It also, you know, whatever public is there, but I'm part of the public on things like this. <laughs> it's nice to know how to navigate the website. I know it's going to be revamped somewhat, but still, there's a lot of data there and there's a lot of information and I don't necessarily follow the logic on how it's designed, but I like this walkthrough so it helps me kind of understand how to approach the data that's available, how to how to inquire about the data that's available. Yeah, I, and I think I appreciate it. we made a decision last week uh, during one of our website meetings that there will be a pretty ready, you know, right in your face uh, button to access our data. Um, so all, you know, all of this data will be under a single point of entry, which will be a little easier than it currently is. Uh, just, uh, just a general question, Dave, and if I could through the chair. Um, Go ahead. The, um, the, 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 the concept I have is that the Carmel River is probably the most studied river on the west coast of the U.S. I don't know if that's really true or not, but I've got this image that it is, you know, one of the more highly researched, uh, you know, river systems. Is, is that still true? I thought I heard something like that several years ago. We think it is. Um, there's been a lot of study on the eel, the Russian, um, you know, all the all the coastal rivers are getting, a, you know, quite a bit of study, but we're probably the most heavily regulated and because there's a source of money um there has been more activity on it so nymphs uh the coastal conservancy is managing the money from nymphs and so they support a lot of projects so it's, it's not only uh highly studied but there's more activity that's taken place and so trout unlimited secured funding to do uh removal of fish passage barriers and you know it's, there's a lot of fingers in this soup add yeah. one last th one last thing dave i forgot about the web portal is the program we used is entirely adaptable um to phones and tablets so it will scale with your phone and your tablet and we did that on purpose because sometimes the websites don't display correctly on different devices so regardless of device it will it will work And, and back to Director Riley's question, no one's really keeping track of the number of studies or how much money is spent um, because there's so many different agencies. But, um, you know, I suspect we're still most heavily studied um, and heavily regulated, you know, but there's no real way of knowing. Well, with the adjudications also out there about how you're regulated, we are the most controlled in a way. Absolutely. Water system. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, Director Paul, you have any questions? Okay, good, good. I'm glad he's there. Yeah, I'm at a meeting. That's why he's picking you up. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, bye bye. Uh, Director Paul, you have any questions on this item? No, I do not. Okay. Uh, but I, I just want to say it, it's it's really, really exciting to see uh may how you know making this data accessible in a in a contemporary way so people make make it more usable, more easily accessible. Uh it's it's nice to see that that you're making it happen. All but, right. Uh, um uh, Jim, what are we going to do about outreach on this one? How are we going to reach the public? I'm glad he introduced us to it. I know other people are going to look at this meeting after we look at it. Which other ways? Are, are we going to do it at the full board level? or whichever Yeah, way? I'm not sure. We haven't really talked about that in-house. You know, we do have, there's about 200 independent users of some of this data. So obviously it's more than just ourselves. We have we have the, um, the the actual diagnostics of 
how many unique uh, email addresses go to certain sections of our website. And then for one of those unique individuals, how many times they access it. Um, and so, for example, you know, a lot of our own staff will be a unique user who accesses it quite frequently. But when you have 200 unique users, you know, that's a clear indication that it's a lot of members of the public. So once this is launched, the current users, whoever they are, are going to find it immediately on their first attempt at, at use. So, you know, it's a little bit of self uh, spreading or self announcing from that standpoint. But uh, no, we'll get the public outreach team together and, and see. But it, it all spins off of when it's fully populated and uh, and working and uploaded. But yeah, we'll find a way to make some sort of announcement. Okay, and um, you're going to introduce the rest rest of the board to this at the next meeting, or you want to wait or no, I think we'll wait. And, you know, it is, it's by design to be very user friendly, at least at the most basic level of just finding out the information you want. Um, so I, we might just direct, you know, make it, make it public, make an announcement, but it's really this committee's kind of work. So we wanted to bring it to this committee uh, to see, but I don't think we need to um, put the whole board through it. Oh, okay. Um, I want to thank you all for, for bringing this up. I was looking forward to, I didn't see the cost or additional monies. So I'm glad to see that. So I'm glad to see you got it up and working. Yep. Within budget, believe it or not. <clears throat> uh, let's, Sarah, let's take it out to the public city and have any comments. Chair Edwards, I see no raised hands. Thank you. Uh, Jan, what's the next item? Yeah, the next item, item three, is uh, a letter received from the City of Monterey as Exhibit 3A, uh, where they are formally requesting the district provide a water supply assessment consistent with the state water code. Um, water supply assessments, as the staff note uh, indicates, takes a look at a 20-year projection, assuming uh, uh, normal years, single dry and multiple dry. Um, the state's requirements for uh, a water shortage uh, contingency plan is to examine five years of drought uh, in the first five years of your planning horizon. So we're, we, the district, uh, have need for water supply assessment for a variety of purposes. The CALAM Urban Water Management Plan is uh, insufficient due to uh, errors that we've detected in it. Um, so we will be undertaking this water supply assessment with a few more scenarios that are useful to us beyond just what the state water code asked for. Um, not the least of which is the phase two proceedings in uh, the the PUC application that uh, we keep waiting to get rebooted and restarted. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to call it to your attention. Uh, it dovetails very nicely with both the, the phase two proceedings, uh, developing the case for lifting the CDO. Um, so I think having a rigorous uh, analysis, um, you know, we do have a lot of data and we know which of the water years were dry and critically dry. Uh, there is an impact on Pure Water Monterey expansion for multiple dry years. Um, so we do want to look at that so we can address that question as it keeps coming up as well. So I, I think uh, I, this is just here for your knowledge. It'll be in the packet of uh, correspondence received for the full board. Um, but our intent is to act on it, and that'll give us, in effect, an interim uh, supply and demand analysis, which uh, may have some, some other benefits to it. That's okay. The uh, item. Director Paul, go ahead. Yes, um, well, first I just wanna um, th thank you, Dave, for it's, it's great that you see all these different uses uh, for the analysis, that, that's, that's excellent. Appreciate that very much. Um, my question is, is the request of the city clear enough to you? I, I 
felt confused by their discussion of conflicting data and conflicting numbers. And I had to read it several times and I still wasn't sure that I was clear about what, what numbers they wanted you to use to answer their questions. Yeah, there there are a couple things that remain a little unclear. Um, and and some of them were just what, what I would call straw man questions. You know, for example, um, well, and they talk about this this completely inconsistent data between the uh, um, the census and AMBAG data and um, and I can see that what they're talking about the inconsistency. But <laughs> what are we supposed to use for the analysis? <laughs> well, that's exactly part of the part of the issue. And there's some uh, discussion about job numbers and yeah, um, big difference. Yeah, and. You know, the, the AMBAG model, which is run every four years versus the census, which is updated every 10, um, will incorporate what the census tells us. Um, when AMBAG first started running this version of their model, um, they tested it against three other models. And the three other models were, you know, uh, the State Department of Finance. I forget who the other two were, but they were really um, keen on how all four models, their own and the three others, gave pretty similar results in terms of population. So I, you know, I'm going to rely on the AMBAG model as a third-party model, um, given that. You know they've tested it and and so forth, but it is troubling that if, that you you know you have two data sets that don't yield the same results, and it's troubling also that AMBAG itself um, assigned housing units uh, in the six cycle RENA document that are different than what they did in their regional growth forecast. So the housing units as assigned don't really line up with the population as assigned to the local district. So, you know, we'll try to address that issue, but, um, you know, there's other things that uh, he's asked for, like, you know, is water available as of the end of 2023? I think was in that letter. And, you know, there's some obvious answers, no. And we also can't project whether the cease and desist order will be lifted based on our analysis or if it's going to stay stuck, uh, especially if we have a contentious uh, debate about supply and demand in front of the PUC. Um, nevertheless, we're going to do what we think is a rigorous analysis and put it out there. And if the city doesn't like it, then I don't know what we'll do. But um, there's there's some, as you've already identified, conflicts in, in data, but I think we lean to the AMBAG regional growth forecast more than census data. Uh -huh. Well, thank you. And I'm sure you'll state what your assumptions are so that it's it's clear what you're using and what the assumptions are. And and you'll just, I know you'll, you'll pick what seemed like the most um, reliable, available. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. And, and I think we'll, just as we have, um, and we're going to have to do for the um, allocation process, we're gonna to have to acknowledge that there's a difference between each city's population forecast and their housing unit allocation. And if houses used water independently of the people living in them, you'd have two different uh, demand numbers. They're not substantially different, but, you know, you also have a situation where, like in Monterey's own case, their housing uh, element, at least their draft, has almost 1,500 more housing units, what they call a buffer, over and above their RENA number. Well, that wouldn't necessarily be a problem, except they've got a huge number, almost uh, 2,100 housing units that are slated for the old Fort Ord. 
Well, Old Fort Ord is served by Marina Coast. And so if the 2100 were in fact built and we're looking at the required housing of 3600 for the city of Monterey under Arena, well, that would mean two thirds of their water use for new housing would be addressed by others and not have to be addressed by us. But now that they've identified this buffer zone, if they fully built out within the city of Monterey, then they would be getting, um, you know, 4,400 housing units in the city of Monterey, more than the arena number. And so what we're trying to address the supply numbers to meet is kind of an unknown because, you know, we don't really think all of the housing will get developed in a timely manner because there just aren't enough developers with enough dollars with enough profit to do it. Um, but, but we're going to have to answer two different questions or three different questions. Um, is it only arena? Is it all five plus thousand with the buffer? Is it inside Monterey and the water management district or is a big chunk of it outside the water management district? And so we're gonna have uh, kind of what uh, Director Paul said before, state your assumptions because um, I don't think we'll be able to answer every single question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just have to acknowledge the the, the known uncertainties. <laughs> exactly. Like, like the cease and desist order and yeah. Okay, thank you. Ed? Uh, I, no, oh, I go ahead. Of, yeah, a couple of questions, Dave, uh, similar. Uh, one report that you will do will serve all the cities and uh, unincorporated. So a single report will cover for everybody. You don't need separate reports. Correct. And second question is, um, if Calam has this, um, uh, you you have your supply and demand. They have their, you know, comprehensive, whatever it's called. Uh, yeah, urban water management plan. Or, 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 or yeah, urban water management plan. Uh, does one have more um, authority, credibility, standing with the state? Uh, who chooses which yeah, one? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So the urban water management plans are supposed to have standing with the state um, because it meets state law and, and they're filed with the Department of Water Resources. Um, we have filed quite a bit of testimony previously uh, stating why there, well, that there are errors in their forecast for supply and demand and that uh, these errors, some of which have already been acknowledged and some have not been acknowledged by Calam, but we also highlighted how they run their review process. You know, they'll notify that there's uh, an urban water management plan being prepared. Then they provide a notice that it uh, will be heard at a hearing and that the draft plan is now available. And they typically have left about a week for review between the notice that it's going to have a hearing and the hearing. And that week will you know, likely include a weekend. And uh, anyway, we filed testimony saying they really don't want any comments. They don't really want us to weigh in. Um, whereas public agencies like Marina Coast and others, you know, they put a draft out there for uh, up to two months for public review. So when we've identified things that we're concerned about, you know, three cycles ago, maybe four, I think at this point, 20 years ago, we provided extensive comments, all of which got ignored. And then the last three go rounds, uh, we did provide comments 15 years ago, which went largely ignored. And then we got the message. And so we didn't provide any comments 10 years ago or the most recent one which was 2020, uh, actually came out in 2021. So um, it's, you'll have folks like the Watermaster, in fact, say, well, it's the official document. Well, it's 
only as official as its vetting process. And, you know, all of these pretty much reflect whatever the urban water provider has told its consultant to put in them. Um, and so the supply and demand stuff, you know, forecasts are not to be believed or taken at their face value. But many agencies like to believe that they are the official document and that they're useful that way. Um, it just seems to me with this um, difference in credibility and, you know, and, and of course, Callahan questions our own study, your study yep. on supply and demand. And uh, if the PUC is ever going to have that hearing, something will happen as a result of that hearing. Who knows what? <laughs> I, I'm a little frightened about how where that might end up. But nevertheless, um, there'll be, I'm just thinking this, this fact, the, the credibility factor maybe should become at least a report to the full board. So we all can look forward to whatever fallout there may be from not only the um, uh, allocation process, but the unhappiness or the disagreements that may emerge and we'll, we may get a lot of that feedback coming through the board. Uh, we may as well be prepared in some fashion. So whether it's a full bore, uh, you know, confidential report or or public report, uh, I think the full board ought to be a little bit prepared about what may be coming. That's that's all I'm suggesting on that point. Yeah. Uh, as as well as well as Marina Coast may be involved in some of these, whether it's Sand City, Delray Oaks, or Monterey. Uh, all three of those cities could have something to say uh, that doesn't jive with some what. Of our version of what we're responsible for, and, and but actually what's going on, there, there will be a difference. Uh, but my, no, I, I guess that that covers my question um, about single reports, main thing, but the potential differences of reaction to where the cities may go for their information versus where we think the real valid information exists yep. here versus Calam. George, ahead, a single report. I, I didn't follow. Single. You mean for all the cities and in the within the district? What what single report? Well, the, my my question really is: This is a request from the city of Monterey. Yes. Every city and the county may have the same requirement that. Yeah, they I was going to ask about that. Yeah. Yeah, if, but that's my point. Do we we write one report for the entire district? Uh -huh. Or do we have individual reports for individual cities? Uh -huh. Yeah. So the 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 requirement is that it meets the system's existing and planned future uses. And so, because the system serves five other cities and the unincorporated county, it necessarily has to include their demands in there. So um, it just by its nature is going to be an all encompassing six city unincorporated county uh, examination. The difference between between this exercise and the adopted supply and demand scenario is we're not simply gonna take uh, uh, like ASR at 1300 acre feet at face value. And the long-term supply and demand forecast that we adopted was also basically a normal year scenario. Now what we'll be able to do is um, we can take a 30 year history of stream flow and how much, uh, you know, whether it was a dry year or a normal year or wet year and so forth, and actually lay those out. But then we can reorder them so that we can actually test the scenario of, well, what happens if there's a uh, five-year drought. What happens if there's a five-year drought at the front end? Um, because, you know, we can build up reserves and, uh, you know, available supply over time, but you you can't do that if you start in drought necessarily. Um, if we're in drought and we need to borrow 145 acre feet to make the pure water Monterey expansion delivery requirement, and you need to do that for five years, um, can you do it? And so there's a, a better recognition of some of the constraints 
on water supply so that instead of taking the normal year, we'll actually say, well, on average, it's going to look like this. But if we get one dry year, we may have this problem. Or if we have five dry years in a row, we may have that problem. And then that may actually uh, inform how much water you allocate in the first go round. Um, you know, recognizing certain constraints that you want to build up storage over time. Um, you know, we know that pure water Monterey expansion is going to exceed current demand or all the available resources are going to exceed current demand. So even if we start in drought, we're going to have more water than the system can use. So there's still storage that will be happening. But I think it'll be useful to actually, and this is where, you know, the public, the board, and others don't really want to get into the numbers, but I think you need to see the scenarios that have been run so that the question's answered. Well, what happens if, you know, you're telling me on average it's going to look like this. What happens if we start in drought? Well, we did that, and that's what it looks like over here, or, you know, so forth and so on. So, but it, it has to include all the other cities because that is, um, you know, existing and planned future use. Okay, one, one other question, Dave. Can you go to 19 of the board packet? It's a chart of uh, Monterey's uh, potential location and volumes, uh, you know, units. And I, I, I'm, just, I'm just trying to understand the, the two categories called opportunity area, the very top, vacant, non-vacant. Can you... Do you have an explanation of what the difference of those two columns mean? Uh, vacant and non-vacant. Yeah, let me see the... Uh, I don't need an answer today. I'm just curious about how to understand the chart. Well, it might be nice to have an answer today. Hang on. I was guessing they were meant that that particular area they're talking about already has some housing on it, but I don't know. I, I yeah. Uh, in, so in their um, notice of preparation of their housing element, there's description before and following this chart. But it doesn't jump out at me. So I'll, I'll reread their housing uh, element, their notice of preparation, and see if I can find that. I'm, I'm just assuming the other cities are going to have very similar formats about what analysis and planning they have for uh, their zoning the descriptions and volumes and so on. And um, I'm just yeah, curious. I'm already seeing a little bit different. Um, as you can see here, there's just two columns where they've uh, like the first column that has two columns in it, the vacant, non-vacant. Right. They have very low, low, and moderate. So that's three of the four arena categories. Mm -hmm. And so they've lumped all three of those together. So you don't know which ones are very low, which ones are low, and which ones are moderate. Okay. And then this other category above mar moderate is basically market rate housing. And so they have identified those um separately so what i'm seeing from the county and they're a little bit behind some of the cities but they've specifically identified for each of their inventory sites how many very low how many low how many moderate how many above moderate so they're they are approaching it differently um a little more granular level of detail i'll, I'll go to the city and inquire just yeah so to satisfy my curiosity. Okay. I don't have any other questions, Chair. I have oh, one. Good. Go ahead. Um, what does educational workforce overlay? What's that? The category on table one, same table. Yeah. Down right under ADUs. Yes. Yeah. So they have a desire to do um, you know, teacher housing. Mm -hmm. 
but I don't know if they identified overlays in the maps. They didn't in the maps. I don't know. <laughs> For that matter, pipeline projects, I don't know what, what they're talking about there either. Yeah, those are projects they already know about. Um, okay. But yes, it, unfortunately, they cut and pasted a table from their uh, yeah. notice of preparation. Uh huh. Without it, tep and tep we're missing the introductory material that explains all that. Okay, yeah. okay. So we can we can find that and and get and an answer uh, get our questions answered that way. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's it, it's fine. I mean, it's I I kind of want to know myself, and I, yeah. I'm not seeing it in there notice of preparation so. yeah. as for the buffer that that's another thing that confused me because i can i can see thinking about a buffer in terms of the possible locations for additional housing because they may not all work out but that's not additional water well it would be if they built them so you know we've uh, in our adopted supply and demand forecast, the, the original, we started with what's your population going to be? And then we grossed up and, you know, basically we said, what's your 25th year population versus your current population by city? And we took that growth rate and we said, okay, your residential water use by city could grow at that same growth rate because again, you know, people use water. Um, and that's a, that's a very reasonable assumption that if this is what you use today and then you grow this many people, then the residential use would go up the same rate. Um, but the housing numbers are a little different than the population numbers. And then this idea of a buffer is kind of even worse because what we've done is we've said, okay, um, in, in a Monterey's case, for example, their arena number is telling them they need 3,654 new units of housing. Their population growth in the regional growth forecast shows only about 1,500 new people. So what you're seeing is more housing units than people, which makes no sense. Right, right. But then you look at Stan City, and they've got a very high uh, housing number compared to its population expectation. And so it just really doesn't compute, even though AMBAG has said in all three of their documents that they are all self-referencing and that the growth forecast includes RENA and the Metropolitan Transportation Plan includes RENA. Um, there's still something missing. Hmm. But then for the city to go further and say, not only could we build 3654, but we could do 5802 units. Well, then we, the district, have to kind of look at that and say, all right, you know, how much water would you need just for the housing units, even though the population forecast doesn't show that many housing units? And that's where we may make a, um, you know, a unilateral decision that no, there's not enough water for 5,802 housing units of a certain mix, um, and therefore, you know, we've only allocated enough for half of the 3,654, and let's get out 10 years and see how much you build. And then we'll, you know, readjust the allocation, and we may have to speed up the next increment of supply. Um, so right now, I, I just look at these numbers as aspirational by the city, but unlikely because you know past history shows that no one builds this many units of housing this fast, especially when you don't have much raw land to do it on. Um, but we have to accept that they believe they could build this housing. Uh, and so we need to analyze it. Including the buffer? 
because to me, yeah. what they mean by buffer is if if um if some of these identified locations fall through, we're identifying more than enough to get like locations. They're, they're not they're not aiming to build more than the arena numbers, right? That's not their objective. But if they if their housing element actually entitles enough property to do 5,800 housing units, because they're not going to build the units themselves. They might build some uh, as the city, but they're, you know, the whole point of RENA is to make jurisdictions identify land, zone the land, and ease the restrictions so that housing can be built. Mm -hmm. So if they do that, and 5,800 homes could be built or, you know, dwelling units could be built. Developers could come in and build 5,800 because now they've, you know, you've entitled it. Our negative view is good luck getting even 3,600 done mm -hmm. um, in a, you know, in a 20 to 25 year period that it'll never happen. We've never seen anything like that. And, mm -hmm. You know, with cost per square foot here, and and this, I don't want to get into my on on the housing soapbox, but the above moderate. So you see this line all the way down near the bottom that says uh, inclusionary requirement. Yes. So they have a one in five requirement. So you build four market rate units and one unit of affordable low income and so that's why this is in the above moderate column and this would be low income housing done on that 20 percent set aside but the other low income would have to be either exclusively low income projects um, or significantly higher uh, percentages of low income. And so you're talking very low and low. And to do those, if, if you did 100% very low and low, chances are you're working with a foundation like uh, uh, Mid-Peninsula Housing or Carmel Foundation or something like that, that don't have a profit motive and play in this business. And, and have access to funds. Otherwise, you have to find a way to make a private developer still make enough of a profit to be interested in doing it. And there are very few developers like that. There are some. And one of the ways you make it possible is to give them the land. So like a you know, school district or the city owned property, they could do that. So the land cost goes out and that could become profit for the developer. But trying to get this many very low and low income units to meet the RENA plan on privately developed parcels is going to be a real challenge because you can only, you know, as they've shown, you can only get 244 units using the inclusionary requirement. So, you know, we're over here, we're supposed to be only about water, but you know, we have to kind of check the assumptions. You know, is it believable? And, you know, are we trying to develop water supply for a pipe dream? You know, housing that isn't really going to get built in 30 years? And the answer is you have to kind of pick somewhere in the middle, I, I think, and then see how it's going. You got to make sure you have enough water to get out five to 10 years and look backwards to see if they're successfully building any of this housing. But, um, you know, are we going to guarantee that there's enough for 5,802 units in Monterey? Unlikely. George, you had your hand up. Uh, I wanted to yeah, ask, how long do you think this water supply assessment report will take? Yeah, you know, it's not a matter of how much time it'll take to do it. It's when will we do it. Um, I know that the letter... I think the ninety, yeah, 90 days from ninety day. days. Yeah. So it'll be ninety days from a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, we're trying to get letters out to 
um, the non-jurisdiction for the water allocation program, meaning Navy, Army, Coast Guard, airport. We promised that by like the 15th, so that's current priority. Um, but this will get, it, it'll get done. It's needed, okay. as I said. You know, it's needed. It's going to be needed for the allocation process anyway, as we begin to show the jurisdictions where our assumptions are coming from. So, so, so we're going to make it as defensible as possible. So that means Mr. Laredo going to be involved in this a little bit more. I think those comments of the PUC got to come from him. Uh, um, we we need to make this as as defensible as possible. So that means all hands on deck at Fran yeah. too. So, you know, y'all y'all need to make the report as, as as thorough as possible. And if, if dealing with the PUC, I like to come from our attorney that that information is due or missing because of them. So um, let's do a good job and make it thorough because it's for everybody. Yep. Okay, any more questions? No more questions on that item? Let's take it out to the public for comment. Chair Edwards, I see no raised hands. Thank you. Okay, next item, GM. Yeah, the last item is an update on Pure Water Monterey. Um, and just a second, before we close out the uh, Monterey topic. I don't know who's doing their environmental impact report, but I see Troy Lawson's on as an attendee for Denise Duffy, so maybe they are doing the Monterey report. Um, anyway, we'll get answers to some of those questions. So um, Pure Water Monterey, uh, the only thing left, uh, or the only thing to know is construction has started. They've mobilized. Uh, I was told by Dave Lindau. Um, it's probably very minimal at this point. Uh, they did their notice to proceed on August 14th. So mobilization, I don't, I don't know, Maureen, you haven't been out there recently. I know when I was out there for a tour a week ago, they had not mobilized because what they're going to do is cut it off for, you know, public access again, probably put another trailer in. But um, nevertheless, the, the work can begin on the advanced water purification facility. Uh, that notice to proceed was issued. The bids on the injection wells, remember the original bids were rejected and they rebid it. They're going to do a bid opening this Thursday um, with an award. You know, they'll bring it to the Recycled Water Committee at the September meeting and then award at the September board meeting with a notice to proceed uh, in probably early October. So that's all good news. And you know, it's the plants working perfectly. We just closed out the second month of the new fiscal year, almost identical in deliveries to the first month. Uh, I believe it was 300 and roughly 320 acre feet, I believe is that number. Um, our requirement of 3,500 uh, only requires about 291 acre feet per month to meet. Um, I mean, you know, whatever 3,500 divided by 12 actually is. Um, so what we're, what we're uh, looking at right now is we're exceeding the monthly requirement. So we should finish out ahead uh, just like we did last year. Uh, you may recall that uh, May and June, there were no deliveries to CalAM and we just increased our operating reserve uh, on our, you know, on our budget. Um, but we're now sitting on water in excess of our reserve requirements. So uh, everything's looking pretty good. And the, you know, the real beneficial aspect of the rains was that the uh, rubber dam on the Salinas River to help augment the Castroville Seawater Intrusion Project has been up and remains up. And so they're augmenting theirs uh, with river water meaning there's less pressure on Monterey One water to deliver more recycled water. And so that uh, competition that we saw a little bit of during last summer um, doesn't exist yet. 
hasn't existed yet. And here we are in you know September. So that's a good, that's a positive. Um, hopefully we get into October and towards the end of the growing season without much conflict and we'll keep our deliveries uh, way up and get a little bit ahead of the, the reserve game. Um, the, the role of, of reserves is going to kind of be revealed in that water supply assessment in dealing with uh, the five dry years at the front end of the planning horizon scenario. Um, so the more we have in reserve in excess of the reserve requirement is actually water that we, the district, can redesignate as company water at any point in time. So we've been paying for a little bit of excess just because they could deliver it. Um, but when the expansion comes online, we have to then raise the reserves. And so this will either be putting us ahead of the new reserve requirement, or it'll give us a little wiggle room to deliver more water if needed, uh, just by renaming it company water. Um, but we do pay for it. It comes out of our budget and it sits there as an asset on our books uh, until utilized. Any, question, any questions? If not, D Dave, um, have M1 did a construction timeline yet? Uh, no. And, we can, and well, um, could you tell them from, from us that we would like to see one in October? <laughs> yeah. So they are preparing to do that. And we also need to amend the water purchase agreement, the amended and restated water purchase agreement, to uh, lock in a performance start date and that performance start date needs us to have the bids awarded for the injection field and then look at them together and then produce exactly what you're asking for an assumed construction schedule with a projected completion date yeah because i i don't think i heard or I, if i missed that meeting that they have why is it going to take two years to do this so, uh yeah you know it's just that's I, I think we need to spell it out to the public yeah the reason it's going to take us two years to do this is because this this and this because when i looked at the plant it looked like they just needed to add pieces to it now, yeah it does it, it's it's deceiving that way right because you look at it and there's a concrete pad and there's a right you know there's a place for another pump and yeah um you know uh I like when they do their assessment, if they tell us uh, they need to build the parts for that or to, to do the, the tubing um, the tubing and, and, and stuff that they have in there. So um, yeah, we get that by our next um, meeting in October? Uh, you know, I'll talk to the project manager. I'm, I'm not sure it's going to be ready in October, but they know they need a, uh, a Gantt chart showing uh, construction. And, and a little, you know, it'll be a traditional construction timeline where you have your own right. uh, pieces so you can see which components are critical path and so forth, so. Okay, any other questions from committee members? If not, I didn't bid you all a good afternoon, but I'm gonna say goodbye with a good afternoon. So all right. Thank you. Thank all you. Right. Everybody. Thank you all. Have a good afternoon. Thanks, Dave. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.